this is your story. This is my story. But most of all, this is the greatest story ever told. This is God's story. Jesus, by the will of God, in keeping with the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dear son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve, as my ancestors did, with a clear conscience, as night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. Recalling your tears, I long to see you, so that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, and trust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness for his appearing. The story is told of a group of children who went on a field trip to visit a world-famous sculptor. As the children were viewing one of his magnificent sculptures of a lion, one of them asked, how did you make it look so real? The sculptor replied, that's easy. I chiseled away anything that didn't look like a lion. You know, that's the goal of the Christian life, for God to chisel away anything in our lives that doesn't look like Christ. One contemporary writer put it this way, our mission is to conform to the image of Christ for the sake of others. Paul gave his life to that assignment. In our last chapter, he wrote these words, My dear children, from whom I am again in the pains of childbirth, until Christ is formed in you. In our chapter today, he writes these words, Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Well, Paul's getting older. His eyesight is failing. His body is beaten down and worn out. He knows for the church to thrive, he must activate the believers to use their gifts in unison to accomplish God's full purpose on earth. In this chapter, he finds himself under house arrest in Rome. There he writes four letters we now appropriately call the prison epistles. One called Philippians is his treatise on joy. Now how can one write about joy from prison? The answer, one who has been chiseled to look like Christ. Paul is teaching us with his very life that in Christ our circumstances do not dictate our joy, our relationship and hope in Christ does. He writes another letter to the church at Ephesus. There he instructs the church about their mission. Here's what he writes. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the teachers, and pastors to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. He instructs us on this powerful mystery. Collectively, we are the body of Christ. We are to come together as one totally unified community, one body, 
one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. We are to value each other. We are to use our different gifts like different parts of the body to accomplish God's upper story purposes. It's kind of an odd analogy, but he says that we are to grow and mature so the size and health of the body matches the size and perfection of the head. That is Christ. And that takes a lot of chiseling. Now fast forward five years. Paul is that much older. This time he's back in prison in Rome, but it's not in house arrest. It is in a wet and dark dungeon. He knows he's not going to make it out this time. He knows it's time for him to pass the baton to the next generation to run the race set before them. Now, one such student is a young man named Timothy. Paul picked Timothy up on his very first missionary journey when he came to the city of Lystra in modern-day Turkey. Paul had invested and worked with him like a son. Timothy is still young and is now on his own serving the church of Ephesus. Apparently, Timothy was extremely talented, but timid, and he had the propensity to back down from leading because of his youthful age. Paul wrote from the prison cell to let Timothy know that the God of the upper story has an upper story assignment from him. Here's what he said to him. I thank God whom I serve as my ancestors did, with a clear conscience, as night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. How encouraging it must have been for Timothy to receive this letter from Paul. To hear, to be reminded that God gifted him and that older mentors were now confirming it. Wow. We all need mentors who speak into our life. It must have also been quite challenging for Timothy to step out of his comfort zone and lead in the midst of some of the older church folks who were looking down on him. Wow. We all need people who believe in us to speak the hard truth into our lives, to tell us how we can grow, how God can chisel away the things in us that doesn't look like Christ. Paul also knew that one day Timothy would be in the same position as him. Timothy needed to think now about multiplying his leadership and passing the baton when it was his time. Here's how Paul put it. You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. Paul knew he would never see Timothy again. He reflects on his life with Christ all these years, from arrogant murderer of Christians to one used by God to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. He winds his letter down with these closing words. You can almost imagine the tears flowing down Timothy's face as he reads these passionate words. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time of my departure is near. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Paul had totally offered up his life to the purposes of God for him in the upper story. He has no regrets. And not long from this writing, historians tell us that Paul was beheaded for his faith and work of grace in Jesus Christ. Now, how did Tim Timothy end up doing with this whole thing of standing up for his beliefs? Well, we just have a hint of it in Hebrews 13, 23. And we don't know for sure if word got to Paul or not before he died, but if it did, I'm sure it made him smile. Here's what it says. I want you to know that our brother Timothy has been released. If he arrives soon, I will come with him to see you. Now, if Timothy was released from prison, that means he had to go to prison. If he went to prison, it means he had to stand up for his faith. 
Timothy was going to be just fine. God had raised up the next generation to carry the torch of Christ's great love with great boldness. As we'll see in the next chapter, the story of God is not done yet. That means that we are characters in the story of God, and this is where we fit into it. Those who have embraced the gospel of Christ have become a part of this new community called the church. While the purpose of the community of Israel was to point people to the first coming of Christ, our purpose, our story, is to point people to the second coming of Christ. That means we need to be like the church at Ephesus. We need to be one. We need to be together on the common mission of Christ. We need to individually and collectively align our lives to the upper story plan. That means we need to be like Timothy. We need to fan and to flame the gifts that God has given us, whatever that gift may be. And we need to use it not toward our own selfish ends, but to aid others in their journey toward God. But most of all, we need to grow. We need day by day to become more like Christ. And as we do, others will be able to see Christ in and through us and just might decide to follow him too. There's no greater calling. Folks, it is our time now to be about the business of God. May we be able to say at the end of our lives what Paul said about his. Our prayer needs to be that God would chisel away everything in our lives that doesn't look like Christ. Let's see if I can do this correctly. Hey, 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 how about that? Technology, it's a, it's a, it's a dispensation from the Lord. <laughs> uh, so again, um, Pastor Jones from Franklin Avenue Mission, um, Pastor Jim is not here today. He was feeling a little bit under the weather, so I'm glad to step in and fill in. That said, this is his PowerPoint, not mine, so we're going to walk through it uh, piece by piece. And uh, hey, maybe I'll figure some stuff out too that Jim's prepared. That'd be great. Like, I didn't know that. Good job, Jim. Pastor Jim, I'm sorry. All right, so um, let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would use us, much like Lois and Eunice and Paul and Timothy, Lord, uh, that you would use us to pass the faith on to the next generation, that is, uh, uh, Pastor Freezy would say, to uh, pass the baton uh, to those who would run the race next. Father, this is not an easy task. Father, it can be an intimidating task. But Father, it is a plan. It is, it is the story uh, that you have prepared for your church that we would last for generation to generation to generation until you come again in your glory. Father, we lift this all to you in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. So uh, Paul's final days. Um, if you were here, uh, chapter 29 is all about Paul kind of going from, from place to place, right? Uh, and there's, there's a motif where he's giving his testimony, if I'm not mistaken, over and over and over again. Paul's arrested. What does he do? He gives his testimony. Uh, what happens next? Paul's put on a prison boat, and it sinks, and what does he do? He gives his testimony. You know, Paul's going between, uh, before governors, right? He's telling his testimony. Uh, but it's, it's all about obstacles and opportunities. Most of us would see being arrested on account of our faith as an obstacle, right? How can we go out and proclaim Christ from a prison cell? Paul did it quite effectively, actually. Paul did it very well. Uh, he, he had a, a legacy that extended from city to city to city. He was able to strengthen and encourage. As Paul's arrests and subsequent confinements take center stage in the week's chapters, so does his in evangelistic and pastoral heart. As he was taken into custody, Paul, Paul used the steps of the barracks as a place to give his testimony. He used a, uh, a two-week hurricane as an opportunity to share the hope of God with the hopeless sailors. It should come as no surprise that this is the same Paul who turned other obstacles into opportunities for God to shine. Lutherans, how many of you love the word testimony? I got one. Got one out of what, ten? Okay. You're a Lutheran, right? If we're, if we're Lutheran, that means God gave the gift of testimony to the Baptists, and we don't have to do it, right? <laughs> Wrong. <laughs> 
How many of you regularly give a testimony? Daily walk should be a testimony, but, but, but verbally, verbally, how many of you have shared? This is, this is what God has done in my life, right? I, I've, I've got a lot of nodding heads. Phenomenal. You would be surprised. Actually, no, you probably wouldn't be surprised. How many places I will go where people don't have a testimony, right? And they say, you know, I, I believe in God. Great. Awesome. I love Jesus even better. Why? Why do you love Jesus? Uh, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know why I love Jesus. I just do. And I'm, I'm still glad that they love Jesus. But where's, where's, where's the story? What has Jesus done in your life? How, is, how has Jesus entered into the world that you live in? How has Christ changed who you are? I'm not saying you need to have a treatise. I'm not saying it needs to be a 15, 20 page essay or a book. But, but have a pocket testimony. You know? You know, if you could boil it down into two, three minutes, that's great, because that's all people pay attention to videos anyway. I, seriously, I, I, I do media, so like I'll, I'll prepare videos. I'm the media editor, editor over at Franklin, so I try to keep everything between two minutes, 90 seconds or, or so, because that's when people scroll on to the next video, roughly about that time. But, can you boil down why you're a Christian? Have a testimony. Be like Paul, eagerly, at every obstacle, at every opportunity. If you're arrested, God forbid, give your testimony to the officer, right? It's, it's, it's not so absurd. Uh, Canada, you, you see stories where, where people are arrested. I'm not saying good or bad about that. Uh, they're being arrested maybe for their faith, maybe because they're being bullheaded, I don't know. Either way, I, it could be. But still, that's an opportunity for testimony. Right? How many, how many opportunities does the Lord give you for testimony every day? <laughs> it's, uh, but again, it's intimidating because a testimony is incredibly personal. There's a vulnerability that goes with testimony. Uh-huh. Absolutely. Absolutely. Chief of sinners though I be, kind of one of those moments. Like I, I have walked through these, these not so great moments in my life. But look what God has done for me. Let, me. let me share my experience with you so that you may also know, that you also may experience what Christ can do. What, Doesn't that make sense, though, when you talk to somebody that's going through what you are, that they understand? Like, Absolutely. Any mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Now, there, there's, there's a really soft nuance, though, when we make this uh, conversation. Because even though it's your story, how God has come into your life, the story is not about you. It's not about you. Who is it about? It's about Jesus. It's about what the Lord can do, right? Uh, so, Testimony is not a Baptist word. It is a biblical word. It's a church word uh, to which you belong. So I hope it becomes part of your vocabulary. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. One of, one of my favorite psalms, um, I, think, I think it was of David. I don't think it was Korah or any other guys. I think it's, uh, I think it's Psalm 89. But he's, he's talking about, um, you know, can, can you raise them from the dead? Uh, and he's talking about, uh, you know, when, when we die, can, can your word still penetrate the grave? Right? Because uh, what, what is the, the greatest looming threat all of us will one day experience death. And what, what can God do? He can overcome it, right? He swallows death up. 
like a whale in Jonah. One gulp, right? And death is gone. It's conquered. But, uh, there, there, is, there is a tremendous amount here, but I could spend all day talking about testimony. Testimony is very important. If you don't have one, write one. Uh, it is important to understand that each of Paul's letters was occasional. It was, in other words, it was a specific occasion that was prompted his writing. Uh, the church splintering and persistent theological questions prompted him to write to the Corinthians. Actually, he wrote two letters to the Corinthians. They were in rough shape. You get two letters, all right? Uh, and suffering prompted him to encourage the Thessalonians. Paul's letter to the Ephesians never addressed a problem. Uh, in typical Pauline fashion, the first three chapters cover the doctrinal basis of the position of the believer, uh, while the second half letter focused on the practice of the believer. This letter encourages the Ephesian church to remain unified because of their calling in Christ. This unity applies to their church relationships, their family relationships, and their collective spiritual warfare. All right, uh, Pastor Freezy on the video, he talked about the, the Philippians too, or it's, a, it's, a, it's just a thing about joy, right? I can do all things through Christ who strength. Better yet, I can endure all things through Christ who strengthens me. That, that's that, that sense of joy. Uh, the Corinthians, they have f two letters. Uh, the first letter to the Corinthians was taking place because they were, uh, above all things, abusing the Lord's Supper, right? Uh, so they were barring people, or they were getting drunk on the wine. They were just abusing the gift of the church. Uh, additionally, there were like husbands and sons sleeping with the same woman, and it was really weird. And Paul's like, hey, cut it out. Not good. Uh, second letter to the Corinthians, uh, they had actually straightened all of their doctrinal stuff up. They had cleaned up their act. Someone had given a testimony to the Corinthian church, and guess what? They got it together. And they became a devoutly faithful church to the point where they actually started going under the same persecution that Paul is experiencing. That was the whole point of the second letter to the Corinthians, right? It's a, it's a church in, um, uh, not persecution, well, I mean, it is persecution. There was, there was a specific, affliction. Affliction is one of the, the key words in 2 Corinthians. Paul's like, hey, you're going to experience, but guess what? There's something better coming, right? There's a testimony there. Uh, I love 2 Corinthians. Actually, the month of June, so starting next week, all of the uh, epistle lessons should be from 2 Corinthians. Good stuff. Pay attention. 2 Corinthians is awesome. All right? Ephesus. Paul had a special place in his heart for the church of Ephesus. It should come as no surprise since he spent more time ministering there than he did in any other single location. Ephesus provides a unique opportunity to track the life of one church to glean insights into its successes and its struggles. While Acts and Paul's letter to the Ephesians provides us with some of the most comprehensive look at the church there, digging into details of other scriptures will provide details that help piece together their distinct history. Uh, I think one of the hand up. Oh, no. Okay. I think one of the other key places that Jim is kind of highlighting here, uh, you get into Revelation chapter 2. Does anyone have a Bible? I should have a Bible. I'm a pastor. All right. Excellent. Thank you. So Revelation, it's uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, a whole bunch of stuff, and then Revelation. All right. That was, that was recorded. Whoops. <laughs> All right, so uh, Revelation chapter 2. Uh, if you're using uh, the uh, NIV, yeah, uh, what, is, what is the heading for Revelation chapter 2? To the church of Ephesus. It's going to highlight things that Ephesus does poorly. It's going to highlight things that Ephesus has done really well. It's kind of going to give a uh, summary view of Ephesus and then point to where Ephesus should go. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. This is Jesus, by the way. This is John's vision of Jesus. All right? He says, I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men and that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them to be false. You have persevered and have endured hardships in my name and have not grown weary. What does that tell us about Ephesus right off the bat? 
Yeah, they were going through persecution. They were going through affliction. They were not having a good time 24-7, right? They were, they were dealing with some pretty harsh realities. And yet, despite these things, what did they do? They endured. They had perseverance, right? Just like Paul, they stood up and said, you know, I know something better is coming. I'm okay with this jail cell, right? I'm okay with what everything is going on in the world because I know that the governor is not on the throne, right? It's not the Roman governor, but who's on the throne? Christ. Christ is on the throne, right? So they're cool with that. Oh, wait. Hold on. Verse 4. <laughs> it gets interesting here. Yet I hold this against you. Whoops. All right? Just because we're enduring doesn't mean that we have everything together. All right? You have forsaken your first love. Remember the height from which you have fallen. Repent and do these things that you did first. If you did not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. Lampstands represent the the churches uh, of of the early Christian church. Uh, So pretty much everywhere that you saw a letter that Paul wrote to, just imagine that that was represented by a, a lampstand. All right. I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place, but you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, who I also hate. Uh, he who has ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. So what did the Ephesians do really, really well? They endured. Specifically, what were they enduring? They were enduring a world that was having the doctrine of the church ripped away, right? The persecution was, well, you know, we don't like you to believe this, but, you know, if you believe this instead, it's kind of similar to what you guys already believe. If you just agree and say that you can, you can bow down and worship the Roman emperor, you can still have Jesus on the side, right? That's, that's a form of persecution. What do the Ephesians say? No. And they took this hard stance that, that purity and doctrine is number one. If we cannot remain pure and faithful as a church, if we cannot have the correct teaching, nothing else matters. Doctrine is number one. And Paul says, hey, by the way, you guys have kept really good doctrine, but you have forgotten your first love. Who is the first love? Christ. The Ephesians, they remained really faithful to the doctrine. And by the way, there is one doctrine of the church. You're either in the doctrine of the church or you're not in the doctrine of the church. But doctrine does not supersede Jesus. Doctrine points to Jesus. You got that distinction? All right. So that's, that's kind of a history of the Ephesian church right there. First love ought to be Jesus. All right, Paul and Nero. You may not know this, but there was a time in history in which two of the most famous men in history of humanity lived in the same city. The Apostle Paul and the Emperor Nero actually overlapped for a short period of time. It was the middle of the seventh decade of the first century. So like the 70s. Great time, right? (laughs) They both lived in the city of Rome, and of course, nobody took note of Paul. Everybody was fascinated with Nero, a young, flamboyant, emperor. Uh, Nero, also not the greatest friend of the Christian church, right? Yeah, Nero, Nero's not great. We like Constantine. Constantine comes a little bit later, right? Constantine was an all right dude. Nero, not so much, all right? There's, uh, there's some other guys in there, too, who are, who are not great. Um, so no one was paying attention to Paul. They were all looking at Nero. So who is Paul? So while he was suffering and growing old in prison, Nero was enjoying life in the palace. He was enjoying the spotlight, and he was one with the future ahead of him. Had you interviewed the common man on the streets of Rome and asked the question, who is going to make the greatest difference in the world, Nero or Paul, they would have undoubtedly said, Nero. Or they would have said, Paul who? (laughs) Who is this guy in jail? Right? Nero is one of the men who, uh, who got what he wanted. He used to stage lavish parties and invite himself to be, uh, uh, to be the entertainment. At the age of 25, about the time Paul was in prison, he uh, deified himself and made himself God to be worshipped. He constructed a colossus, a large statue, 120 feet tall, and he was the figure at the top. Rome had no choice but to look up to Nero. Had Rome even acknowledged Paul, they would have looked down at him. Um, 
By the way, this is not the first time someone has made an odd statue to bow, to bow down to. Right? This is history repeating itself over and over again. I mean, you had the golden calf, right? That's one example of a statue. There's, there, there, was a, there was another guy a little bit later by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. You guys remember him? And what, what did he ordain? Right? How awful is that? <laughs> Not me. I would. I don't want to. Right? If the, if the, if the options are to bow down and, and uh, disgrace my faith in Christ, or to be faithful even unto the point of death, kind of goes with testimony. Lutheran's not really comfortable with that whole last part, right? We're okay just kind of stepping back and letting things happen. But is that the Christian belief? Is that the Christian faith? Is, not, is that the faith that we profess that we hold dear to ourselves? Not at all. So this, this is something that repeats over and over again. By the way, there were, there were three guys, Shad, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? And what did they do? Yeah, there was a fourth guy in the furnace. Uh, I, I'll blow your minds and say it, it, was, it was the pre-incarnate Christ, even though he wasn't born yet. God, Jesus, can uh, exist outside the realm of space and time, which is really cool and really, you know, mind-blowing. But Jesus was there with them. And what was Jesus doing? Protecting them, shielding them, right? God is faithful, right? God is faithful. In the same way, um, God was faithful to the Roman church. Sure, they may have been thrown to lions, may have been thrown in the Colosseum, they may have experienced lots of terrible things, but what did they inherit? Eternal life. Right? It's, that, it's, that rebor- uh, it's that rebirth, the water and the spirit that we talked about. We get to see something bigger and greater. The Apostle Paul apparently wasn't too much to look at. Surviving from the first century in his one description of Paul's physical appearance, he was bald-headed, bow-legged, strongly built, a man small in size with meeting eyebrows, uh, with one large nose. He had a unibrow! (laughs) Get that man some tweezers. All right? Someone once asked Luther what Paul looked like, and he pointed to his friend Philip (laughs) Uh, and stated he was an ugly little man like Philip here. Uh, um, Philip Melanchthon, he was kind of like the, the number two general. He was Luther's lieutenant during the Reformation. You guys, you guys heard of Melanchthon before? Okay. So uh, he was the guy who wrote the... Uh, Aug- uh, the, the uh, no, that would have been Athanasius. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the Augsburg Confession, right? So uh, if you guys have ever seen the Book of Concord, which is like the larger version of the small catechism... Uh, There's this thing called the Augsburg Confession, which is everything that we believe to be true about our Christian faith. Uh, Most notably, uh, you guys can write this down when you get into the the Augsburg Confession. Article 4 is justification. Justification is the article on which the church stands or falls. And it is about how do we know? How do we know for sure that we have been saved? And the answer is Jesus Christ. The church stands and falls on justification through Jesus Christ. He is, he is the center of it all. If, if we take Article 4 out of it, if we, are, if we are unlike the Ephesians and let our doctrine get watered down just a little bit, how quickly would we lose Jesus? Very quickly, right? right? Um, so anyway, that's, that's Melanchthon. Um, Melanchthon also gets a bad rap because he watered down the Augsburg Confession at one point. I don't know if he just watered it down or it was poorly translated, but he gets a really bad rap. Um, I think he was a very great guy. He actually uh, did a really good commentary on Romans. Uh, Luther was really well known for his commentary on Galatians. Uh, Melanchthon wrote a a really solid one on Romans. Um, If you want extra reading, go for it. All right, Um, 2 Corinthians 11. I have worked much harder, uh, been, uh, I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently and have been flogged more severely and have been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews and 40 lashes minus one. Uh, that would be the death lash, by the way. Once you get hit with the 40th, that's kind of like, oh, you're just expected to die. That's, that's kind of how it works. Um, 
Uh, three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. Uh, spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers and dangers with bandits and danger from my fellow Jews and danger with the Gentiles and danger with the city and danger in the country and danger at the sea and in danger from my false beliefs. Or fr- not my false beliefs, and danger from false beliefs. And all of those dangers and all of those experiences, what do you think? It starts with a T, by the way. What do you think Paul was doing? Testifying. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, prisons were not much better than a cave. So <laughs> uh, prisons back then, a lot of Michigan basements. Uh, yeah, imagine that. <laughs> uh, Paul Sandal Prince, we'll, we'll keep moving. It's a wonder that the old man could still walk, but he walked indeed. You'll find his sandal prints all over the known world, from Corinth to Ephesus, Thessalonica, uh, Galatia, Colossae. He made his uh, trips through Jerusalem and Antioch, Cyprus, Crete, Malta, Athens, uh, Syracuse, and Rome. Uh, and these weren't tourist trips, right? You know, uh, he didn't go to see the sights or fish. Uh, these were working trips, uh, ministry and teaching and healing. When he was welcomed, he was prone to stay in a place like he did in Antioch for three years uh, where he established the church. Antioch was kind of like the, the capital at one point for the Christian church, by the way. Uh, Antioch, I believe it's in uh, Syria, modern day Syria, over that way. Um, Turkey, one of the two. But uh, yeah, by the way, the church... Its roots, it's an Asian church. Something weird to think about. Because we're, we're, when we think about the church, where do we typically think? Yeah, we think, we think Rome, Europe, or Lutherans, we think Germany, right? <laughs> uh, but the church really took root in Asia, right? Uh, also, Christian roots, also in Africa, specifically North Africa, and you go down south, you get the Ethiopian church, one of the oldest churches in the world, right? Uh, the church is an international church. It's not one locale. It's not one people group. It's every nation and every tongue, right? Paul in Ephesus, or uh, Ephesus for two years. That's where Paul stayed. Where according to one source, he would walk all morning and then preach in the afternoons. He would preach in the temple uh, that was called the Hall of Tyrannus, uh, kind of a public lecture hall run by a guy named Tyrannus. Uh, and he would make it available in the afternoon. So each day from about 11 a.m. to 4 p.m., Paul would preach and teach every day except the Sabbath day uh, for two years while he was in Ephesus. Uh, the guy was tireless, noting, uh, or nothing slowed him down. Um, there's, a, there's a famous movie director by the name of George Lucas. Has anyone ever heard of George Lucas? Yeah, what, uh, what, did he, what did he produce? Star Wars. Yeah, he did that. He did Willow. Another good one. But uh, uh, is anyone familiar with um, Count Dooku in Star Wars? Yeah. Uh, Christopher, um, Christopher Lee, right? Um, you know what his Darth Lord name is, by the way? Count Dooku, Darth Tyrannus. If you want to figure out where a lot of George Lucas Star Wars names come from, you find them in the Bible. Uh, what planet did the Ewoks live on? The forest moon of Endor. Also a biblical place. That's where Saul went and found the witch at Endor to resurrect Samuel. All right? Uh, George Lucas, very well versed in scripture. Uh, I, won't, I won't speak for his faith. I don't know his faith. I don't know where he stands on any of that. But you find a lot of biblical names in there. Um, Side point, anyway. Uh, Paul was a busy guy. He actually was the, the original worker-priest model. Uh, he would work all day. He was a tent maker by trade. And then he would go and he, he would preach. Every day, by the way, not just Sunday. In fact, that was the day he didn't preach. <laughs> that was the day he took off. What, what a reverse model of a world we live in today, right? Yeah. Very, very different world. Um, what, if, what if we were church every day? Not church, just Sunday. I, I don't know what Jim was intending with his PowerPoint, but I'm taking it to, to flip the model of church, right? We don't often give our testimony, not necessarily those in this room, 
but that's what Paul did, right? Paul says, be imitators of Christ. Or, if you don't know what that is, be imitators of me, as I am an imitator of Christ. Right? Have a testimony prepared. Be in the word. Be as the church. Hear the word of God. Not just Sunday, but every day. Do you think the church has gotten it a little backwards at some point? I, uh, I, won't, I won't ponder a guess and say this, this pinpoints where the church got it wrong, but I think we have the model backwards. Paul was a busy guy. When he wasn't preaching or traveling, he was writing. And that's the reason we cherish his thinking to this day. He was writing letters to the Roman church, the Galatian church, the Corinthian church, the church of Thessalonica. In addition, he penned personal letters to Titus and Timothy. He argue, he's arguably the most influential author in the history of mankind. In between journeys or in prison, he would pick up his quill, and uh, with papyrus, he would write or dictate letters that which uh, could be read throughout the churches. Paul is also credited with the Gospel of Luke. It was kind of like an oratory, and Luke would kind of scribe it down for him. Same with Acts, right? Um, yeah, so he, he, I mean, he did write it, but Paul is often kind of credited with, with telling the story. Yep, yep. So Luke was kind of like a scribe in that, in that regard. Uh, Luke very well could have been there, you know, recounting as, as well, uh, but this was the testimony, the testimony of Paul on full display. Uh, especially the book of Acts, because Paul was there for Acts, right? Uh, Paul very well could have heard the gospel from Matthew, Mark, or uh, John at that point. Galatians 3, 1 through 3. Uh, it wasn't all inspirational poetry with Paul, however. Uh, he was a surgeon who sought to remove the tumors from the church with sentences like this one, you foolish Gentiles. I've now I've got like an evil Batman laugh going on foolish Gentiles, uh, who has bewitched you. Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly betray, uh, portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by l believing what you have heard? Are you so foolish? Are you beginning by the means of the Spirit or, or, or now are you trying to finish by the means of the flesh? Uh, this kind of goes directly along with our sermon message today, right? It's not about completing the law. You don't complete the law. Who completed the law? Jesus completed the law. He didn't, he didn't abolish the law, but he fulfilled the law. The law is the work of Christ. It doesn't get you off the hook. We should abide by the law as much as we possibly can, but Jesus is the one who fulfills the law. So if the work of the law is for Christ to have been fulfilled, what role does the law have in your salvation? Absolutely. And this is why I want to highlight Philip Melanchthon with Article 4 of the Augsburg Confession. Jesus Christ has justified us. He has paid for our sin. Justification is, is, is the balancing of scales, right? If something is balanced, if it is even, that's what justified means. Christ has balanced through the work of his own body. When he sacrificed himself on the cross, the work of the law can never be completed and finished by us, ever. So by whom are we saved? Jesus. And when do we receive faith in Christ? At baptism, through the hearing of the word, through the promise given to us through the water, by the Holy Spirit coming and dwelling with us. Baptism's really unique, by the way. Um, can the Holy Spirit work through any means he so desires? Sure, he can. He can. Where is it guaranteed to happen, though? specifically through baptism, right? This is Matthew 28. Go, th go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing and teaching them in the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. It's guaranteed. The Holy Spirit can work through whatever means he wants, and he does. But where do we know for sure that the Holy Spirit will show up every single time? Baptism. Paul's theology. Uh, he summarized his entire theology with one sentence from the book of Ephesians. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For it is by the grace that you have been saved 
through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no man can boast. Don't worry about being reborn from your mother's womb. Don't, don't even think about it, all right? Paul is the one who helps us to see what we earn salvation, or helps us to see that we can, oof, Paul is the one who helps us to see that we can earn salvation no more than we can earn a mother's love. It is a gift. By grace you have been saved through the redemption that is Christ Jesus. Grace was what turned his, word ups, uh, his world upside down. When he discovered grace, Saul became Paul. And he hit the road, uh, and the road hit back. How did he survive? After this attempt on his life, he was sent to Caesarea, uh, Philippi, where he awaited trial. That took two years. Uh, no due, uh, it's not due process. It's the, uh, the speedy trial, right? It's speedy trial. Uh, that was loaded. He was loaded on the boat with other criminals and sent to Rome for trial. And midway through the journey through the Mediterranean Sea, a hurricane uh, pounced on the boat, and they nearly drowned. Paul was left stranded and soaked on the island. You read his story. What do you think? How did he survive this? How did he survive? His, yeah. Absolutely. God allowed Paul to survive. For what purpose? To give his testimony. To keep, to keep going. To give his testimony. To keep going and give his testimony where? In Rome. The high seat of the world at that time. All roads led to? Rome. That meant that Rome led to? All other cities. What purpose did God save Paul for? So that his testimony could appear in Rome and then explode out into the world. All right? A rough life. Does it help you to know that this, the most influential Christian of all time, had to face so many challenges? I think we need to know that sometimes a Christian life is a rough life, but it's a good life, and the Apostle Paul would not have traded his life for any other life. We read this in the letters, uh, the man of passion and love who considered it a joy to struggle on behalf of Christ. He's anchored in purpose. Paul anchored himself to a purpose that was higher and more important than his life. How many people need that today, to be a part of something that's larger than them? Yeah. He realized that he was part of the work that began before time began, and that will continue long after his life is over. And he is repeatedly uh, telling us that we should do the same, that we should anchor our lives to something higher than this one. By the way, what time does uh, Bible study get over? 11.15, so I've got... It's 11... All right, so five minutes. All right, so I've got three slides. We can, we can get through three slides in five minutes. Oops. All right, so he writes to Timothy, uh, for I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight, and I have finished the race, and I have kept the faith. Now there is more, uh, there is uh, in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to, that, uh, to those who long for his appearing. This is really important, all right? When we talk about giving a testimony, when we talk about handing the baton off to the next generation, as Paul is doing, let's think back to Joseph in Genesis. What was the thing that Joseph did right before he passed? called all of his sons to him, right? And what did he do? He gave his final blessing, which pointed to, at that point, Yahweh, the Lord of hosts, right? The God of my fathers, right? Remain faithful. How many of you um, have had parents who have passed already, Right? Whether it has happened to you or whether it has not happened to you, what is the power of the last thing your parents telling you? It sticks with you forever. What is the last word that Paul is giving to Timothy, who, by the way, Paul calls his son? He's kept the faith, right? He's testifying. 
I finished the race. I am receiving the crown of righteousness. I am receiving something way better than you and I have ever experienced on this side of eternity. Now, I, uh, I, I, don't, I don't hope it's anytime soon for any of you, but what are some of the most important words you can give your children when you know it's your time to go and receive the crown of righteousness that Christ has given to you? Absolutely. One of the most important testimonies you can give is the testimony on your last day to the ones who you love most. Say, hey, I know my time here is up, but remember, this is not the end. And if you want to see me again one day, just as I want to see you, this is the way. Right? Um, I don't care about Nero. He didn't like Jesus. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I love people who, who don't know Jesus yet. I just want to clarify that for the screen. But in terms of this class, Nero was, Nero was not uh, a positive role model in this instance. All right. Uh, but whatever, uh, uh, Paul writes, but whatever we gain uh, or gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all all things. I consider them garbage. I consider this world trash, refuse, worthless, that I might gain Christ. The things of this world are temporary. Everything, everything will go away. That's the tangible things like money, gold, silver, cash, bitcoin, whatever it is. That's the intangible things like power, reputation, right? respect. All of those things, whether tangible or intangible, will disappear except faith in Christ. All right? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you've given your servant Paul. Father, you've given your servant's testimony through Paul that we might be strengthened and pass the faith on to others. Father, we pray that you would remind us, that you would point to us, that you would give us opportunity to share our testimony. And if we haven't spent a lot of time thinking about it, God, instill in us a desire to learn how to give a testimony, to share the incredible, impossible things you have done in our life. Not for our glory, but for your glory. That people might see these things and give glory to our Father who is in heaven. That all generations, Lord, would come to faith and trust in you. Father, we pray this through the Holy Spirit and in the name of Christ. Amen. All right. Thank you guys for a great class.